Hey there, cats and kitties. I am the Blues Man, Johnny Blues. With this video, I'll be discussing my thoughts on the anime series Shangri-La, which I just got done watching as of the time of this recording in this Save Pack DVD release. And this was just a mesmerizing and satisfying series to watch. Um, it's one of those series that, very much in its early going, it has so many different mysterious and complex aspects that you're really questioning. Are they going to be able to successfully bring all of these different puzzle pieces together in the fruition of the story? And they thoroughly do in a very satisfying, impactful way, much akin to a broomstick with all of its fronds and offshoots going in all different kinds of directions at the tip, you know, at the one end. They are tied together very well, the entirety of the ensemble cast, all kinds of kick-ass though they may be, and all of their stories wrapped together to fulfill that one broomstick. And as I say, the fruition is just all kinds of kick-ass and mind-blowing. And uh, at its heart, it's very much a story about, you know, sort of rebellion against an empirical government in a not too distant future Japan where the world has succumbed to environmental overgrowth in the aftermath of mankind's machinations on the environment, global warming, all these different kinds of things. And uh, in Japan, you know, you basically have the well-to-do had come together in answer to this and built a sort of Tower of Babel uh, skyscraper overlooking this small impoverished city called Duomo, and they call this giant tower Atlas. And you're following around mainly uh, the main character Kuniko Hojo, who at the start of the series is just getting out of Juvenile Hall. Uh, it turns out she's been in there for two years for a crime she didn't even commit. She took the fall for a friend, as we find out, is revealed later in the series. Um, but she is very much sort of the heiress to this rebel movement called the Metal Age, which is overseen, the current president of which is actually her grandmother. And um, it's all about sort of trying to fit her into that mold. And she really doesn't want to have anything to do with it at the start of the series. And the series presents her with many sort of trials and tribulations that change her mind <laughs> in more ways than one that the government needs to be taken down a peg. And uh, again, it just features an ensemble cast of characters that are so memorable and unique. And each one of them has a story arc of their own that comes to a successful fruition by the end of the series throughout the course of it and uh, it's a series dealing with a lot of different sort of societal and uh, you know commentary aspects from the environment to poverty politics government the military soul searching and the battle one you know, wages within themselves, uh, sort of societal and governmental rebellion, redemption, all of these different things come into play throughout the course of the story. And Kuniko is such an awesome character. She's a badass wielding a boomerang, uh, and she has several different ones that she has to have throughout the course of the series, because either she loses it or uh, it gets broken in, you know, a battle and everything like that. Um, her sort of best friend and caregiver, uh, or the closest you can say, you know, to that in her life is this transgendered guy by the name of Momoko and she is absolutely fantastic dropping the innuendo left right and center all throughout the course of the series in even in the most heated and uh, detrimental of situations she's always got something to say and it gets you cracking up no matter what um, as I say her grandmother uh, Nagiko Hojo she is the current president of this rebel faction the Middle Age and it seems like Throughout the course of the series, she's a questionable character, and she has a history that Kuniko will eventually unravel. And it kind of causes a divide between them as how it pertains to the building of this uh, Tower of Babel that is Atlas and uh, the overseer woman who happens to be running the entire affair, Ryoko Naruse, who is just prime frickin' evil. I mean, out of all of the anime series, and there are a lot that I have watched, she is one of the darkest, most malevolent villains I've ever seen, ever. Um, she is sadistic. Uh, she's, you know, just absolutely manipulating a puppet master. And almost, you could say, inhuman with some of the things that she tries to do, some of the way she tries to manipulate people, and that kind of comes into play in the story with a big-time revelation to do with her origins and such like that. She is the leader, the CEO, if you will, of Atlas, and she even uses that to... Um, basically appoint herself as the Prime Minister of Japan at one point to solidify just everyone's suffrage. <laughs> you know, not just Duomo and the impoverished citizen thereupon uh, that Kuniko is trying to, you know, save the lives of and everything and make more beneficial the lives of, but 
it gets to the point where it escalates to the entirety of the world. And there's this character by the name of Karin who uh, is very much a hacker. She's got these two friends, Claris and Zhang, who are, she only knows through sort of the online environment, but each of the three of them are manipulating the economy by hacking and, uh, you know, forcing governments basically to sign off on these waste disposal things to do with the carbon production, which has overrun the world. The entire economy is sort of based around carbon production and the waste disposal management and all that kind of stuff. And she thoroughly exploits it. And very much through the course of the story do we find that she is a linking factor between a triumvirate, the main triumvirate that the series follows, Kuniko, as well as uh, these two other characters. One is Mikuni, this little girl with supernatural powers. And it's interesting because as you're introduced to her character and her supernatural ability, which is basically to sense people who are being disingenuous and uh, who are lying, she immediately can punish them with this psychic ability of basically crushing their entire body like a foil ball. And, uh, you know, it's interesting that because it also intertwines into the overriding story, which there are actually supernatural forces at work, and the mutual link between Kuniko and this little girl Mikuni happens to be, uh, you know, these knives that have been taken from sort of a weapon of legend. And it turns out the third leg in that triumvirate is this cat by the name of Kunihito Kusanagi, who is a military guy. Uh, young man though he may be, he's very patriotic and for the cause, for the government, and taking down Kuniko when he first meets her. But he has sort of an evolution of his own in his mindset and taking into question everything that's going on around him, and even the purpose of his orders. You know, he's seeing the more grand story unfolding between the impoverished and this Lord government, if you will, and these supernatural things that are going on. He also possesses one of these knives, and all three of these knives resonate with an energy that pertains to basically the overriding machinations of the leader of the government as she becomes Ryoko. And it all has to do with just Armageddon. You know, I mean, basically the entirety of humanity is on the line by the end of this series, throughout the course of it. And it takes these three coming together through various means, as well as their surrounding characters. You have this sort of muscle-bound guy, Takahiko, who's also an enigmatic character. He seems very plain stated at the beginning as just sort of being the bodyguard of Kuniko. And there's so much more depth to his character that you get in brief snippets. And by the end, you're kind of glad how his story plays out, even though you know, you're, you're questioning where your loyalties lie with him. Are you for him? Are you against him? Um, most of the time, you're pretty much for him. But then when these revelations start dropping like bombs for all these different characters, it comes into question, can you really even trust him as of you were watching the story and uh, how he, you know, comes into play with Kuniko and her journey. Uh, Momoko actually has a friend, you know, a sort of a life companion uh, in the character of Miko, who is a character at the beginning again that you're left wondering how her story is going to come into play, another transgender character. Um, but she is so heartwarming and genuine and has, is filled with compassion and just a good heart. And she becomes the sort of tentative caregiver of this little girl, Makuni, with the psychic abilities. And again, it's kind of like, well, will her time be up at some point through the course of the story? And it's really sad what ends up unfolding for Miko, but Miko is such a good-natured soul with all these supernatural forces coming into play. Even when you think you have everything sort of figured out and all these different players are in their relative positions in the way the story is supposed to, you know, follow through its form and function, even above, like, the malevolent Ryoko Naruse, there is still a puppet master beyond her that goes all the way back to the formation of the entirety of this Atlas uh, sort of, you know, I guess you could say harmonious environment that is in answer to just the havoc, the, you know, natural environment of the world has wrought in the answer of mankind's own actions. And all of these themes come together, again, in such a satisfying way. Um, it doesn't become, like, overly simplistic, but everything fits together, and you get all of the answers by the end, and uh, not before almost losing everything. The entire world is at stake in the balance, and uh, it's just amazing to see these characters come together, to see all of the ones that, you know, <laughs> have had 
mysterious enigmatic elements to them and how those things are answered throughout the course of the story, whether people are, you know, sort of killed or sacrificing themselves or uh, just for the greater good or being selfish and mystifying and mind-blowing. And again, you're not sure where everything is going and how these things are all going to come together. But if you stick with it, the payoff is very much worth it. And uh, it's just awesome. I couldn't more highly recommend it. So I'd love to hear from you guys in the comments below. If you've seen Shangri-La and you're familiar with it, what you thought of it when you watched it, uh, or if you'll be checking it out as per this recommendation. And, uh, you know, otherwise that'll be pretty much it for me on this. So I hope this video finds you well, and I'll catch you all later. Peace.